And I am greatly encouraged by people who have every ability, and she does, you could go anywhere and get a job today, literally anywhere, says, no, it's more important that I serve the Lord. And we're going to ask Cynthia to come and talk to us about what she's going to do. God truly does work in mysterious ways. I wanted to be a missionary nurse ever since I was really little, but um, God did not have me do that right away. He put me in a nursing job at first when I graduated, then unexpectedly and dragging, kicking, and screaming, he put me into nursing education for 17 years. I taught at Bob Jones University in their nursing program, and I watched all my students go out to the mission field, including Papua New Guinea, and I wanted to go, and God did not lead me to go at that point. He definitely made it clear that I was where I was supposed to be. So imagine my surprise after 17 years of teaching, as well as um, several medical mission trips and a number of summers in Mexico as a camp nurse, God put into my hands and led me into a ministry in Papua New Guinea. I work in a bush clinic um, there in Papua New Guinea in the middle of the Highlands region. Um, I am a nurse practitioner. Part of the things that, uh, the preparation that I was able to make while I was teaching was to get both my nurse practitioner degree and also a degree in biblical counseling and then some advanced education um, in education. And so God took me through all of that, not really knowing where that was headed, um, but God put me into a bush clinic there in Papua New Guinea. I love using nursing um, on the mission field. Um, we have people come in with all kinds of physical problems. We have people come in that have life-threatening problems. And as you take care of them, as you are spending two hours sewing someone up, you are impressing upon their mind and heart that God had mercy on them. He preserved their life. He could have killed them at that particular time. Their life could have been over, but it isn't. And then you um, tell them the gospel again, and you tell them how much God loves them. You have ladies who come in who have been beat up by their husbands. You can tell them how much God loves them, how much he cares about them, the mercy he's had on them, and you have a chance to give them the gospel because you're showing them Christ-like love. Um, we have ladies who, um, a lady recently who lost a baby at six weeks old. Since then, she started attending one of our church plants, has made a profession of faith, and by last report is growing. Had another lady who... A year ago, almost to this date, um, on September 20th, I delivered her second uh, baby girl. Um, but in between there, her first baby girl, who I'd also taken care of since she was really little, died at nine months old, a, a year before that. In the interim between her first baby dying and the second one, she also had been attending church sporadically, made a profession of faith, has continued faithful in the church, and then God gave them a second baby girl. But all in that time period, you can see God's goodness, God's mercy, God's grace um, during that uh, time period. Um, uh, physical problems in the states, you have to be very careful. You can't go right into the gospel in the hospital setting. You have to wait for people to ask you questions. There, I can go right into it and give them the gospel as a result of their physical problem. Older people come in, they're close to death, they talk about how their body is failing, and you tell them, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how long you're going to live. You might die tomorrow, I might die tomorrow, but you need to be ready to meet God, and let me tell you the gospel, let me tell you what God has done to give you eternal life. Um, I work in the context of two church plants. We have a team there, uh, two couples, four single ladies, and um, my burden is for the women and children. Um, my burden is my, the women's side of church planning. We need strong families. We need strong women. We need godly women, godly teenagers, godly young adults. My burden is to work one-on-one, -on -one, both in counseling, discipleship, evangelism, mentoring, because these ladies don't know how to sit beside somebody and go through a Bible study. They don't know how to keep up a mentoring relationship. And that will be important for strong women and strong teenagers and people growing up in the church to be able to be a part of the national leadership 
leadership in an indigenous church there. So my burden is to be able to work, especially one-on-one -on -one with the ladies. Often my entry into the family is through the children. I love children, I'm a pediatric nurse. Um, I love the baby's children side of the clinic as well as in the church and that ends up being my entry into their families and my desire is to further that type of ministry and have that be my niche as God so allows me. Um, right now I am on deputation. Um, I'm at about 35%. My desire is to go back to the field by May of next year. If God would so allow that, that would be exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think, but he can do what he wants in spite of a pandemic and everything else that's going on. So thanks for praying for me. I do have a table out there and I do have prayer cards if you want to take one or if you have any further questions. Thank you so much. You ever have things go through your mind while somebody's speaking? The song, Marvelous, Infinite, Matchless Grace, Freely Bestowed on All Who Believe, Yonder on Calvary's Mount Outpoured, There Where the Blood of the Lamb Was Spilled. Aren't you glad today that you understand the grace of God? We also have a missionary that are here, I think they pronounce their name Bretagne, is that right? Uh, the first missionary I can remember meeting was back in junior camp, back in 1957. And I was in junior camp and we had missionaries from, guess what, from Liberia, the Zerbies. And I remember the Zerbies not because of of all the missionary work and stuff that was done, but because they introduced us to some very negative things that, that they were pertaining to with the witch doctors, etc., in central Liberia. Liberia then got a Christian president, or Christian leader at least, and changed the format of some of the things that were done in Liberia. And so I have a great uh, liking or thinking of Liberia, and we're going to ask uh, Brother Bill to come and his dear wife and tell us what's going on in Liberia today. Thanks for that warm-up. Yeah, Liberia, how Kathy and I have been involved with Liberia is in the early 1990s, two missionaries from Baptist Mid Missions contacted us, Rachel Sildroff and Beth Jones, who are living in Staten Island, working with refugees who had left a lot of, as a matter of fact, more people per capita uh, have left Liberia than any other country in the world because of a 15-year civil war. So all these refugees left, and including the missionaries, had to because their lives were on the line. A few missionaries who stayed actually were killed during the war. And so these missionaries followed the refugees, and then they started contacting the Baptist Children's Home. Some of you know I was the president of the Baptist Children's Home and worked there for 20 years. And so in, in the early 90s, we started caring for refugee kids, and then we were asked by ABWE to go into the country to care for orphan and needy kids, working with the AFBM, the African Federal Baptist Mission, whose great-grandparents and grandparents came to Christ through Baptist Mid-Missions. So we hold Baptist Mid-Missions in very highly esteemed. But ABWE came in and started doing a bunch of works along with AFBM that have been very effective in reaching people for Christ. Liberia right now is the fourth poorest country in the world. And because of this 15 year civil war, we would just say they were set back 100 years and the entire country has PTSD. That's the only way to describe it. And so the needs there are tremendous. So when I contacted, I contacted ABWE because some of their more recent works that they had done with AFBM were being very effective. But I said, I can't live in Liberia, and one of the reasons is, and it's just true, Kathy it's can't, too hot. Kathy it's can't too handle hot the heat. I mean, because it is 85 to 90 <laughs> degrees, 80 and 90 percent humidity. I can handle the heat a little better. But we said, and we just had three grandchildren, so we're like, it doesn't make sense for us to feel like we need, that we should live in Liberia. And actually, ABWE and our home church confirmed this with their philosophy, and their philosophy is to train nationals to reach nationals, which is the big movement in, so we were just telling ABWE, this works for us, but they actually said, no, this is, what, <laughs> this is what we're doing. So they were very excited now for the last six months, we've been missionaries with ABWE. Go ahead, tell a little bit about Liberia. 
you. I didn't tell all about it. Okay, I didn't know when he what he was going to turn over to me to say or not. But when you said that about missionary, and I can't remember his name, but Mr. Zerby, and I've, you know, read some about him and the Lobbins and the Gunters, and all the work that they've done there. We've been in one of those terrible, terrible villages that is most known throughout the whole country for their evil black magic. And even when we have told other believers that we have gone to this particular village, they gasp and are surprised that we've been there. But you know what? Because of the, because of the Lord working in the lives of the AFBM and the leadership, they have been able to plant a Bible-believing Baptist church right there in that town. And praise the Lord, you know, I've got a picture of Bill standing next to Pastor Denny. And so the gospel is reaching all these different parts of the country. And it's just so exciting, but they need help. Like Bill said, it's the poorest country in the world. They have fourth, gone poorest fourth poorest. The they have gone through so much. And but the the Liberian people are so loving and friendly, but they need our help. And so we we know many people in the U.S. here, many pastors, individuals who have a heart for missions, but they just don't know of the needs and and how they can help over there. And so we'll be bringing teams over. We'll be working on different projects to help them revitalizing some of the things that Baptist Mid had done before the war that we want to help to re start that had to stop because of the war. So we, we're just very excited. We were there in February, praise the Lord, before all of this happened, and we're hoping to go back around November 23rd for a few weeks. If all of the travel opens up, we have a medical team scheduled to go at the beginning of March that we will be going with. So and, and Cynthia is so right with medical missions. You have mm -hmm. to understand some of these countries, we talk about health care as being a problem in our country. Some of these countries almost have no health care. So people are dying of diseases that you don't, you have teledoc would take care of yeah. you. They don't have any doc. And yeah. so the outreaches that they're doing through some of these medical clinics are saving people's lives. And uh, Cynthia, you're just so right. When you yeah. save someone's lives phys physically, they're open to hearing about what you have to say spiritually. And they're actually 15% of the population in Liberia is Muslim. And some of these clinics are really having a big impact on the Muslims because they realize these Christians, no matter what anybody says about them, they love us. And once they get that message, that's very strong. And just to give you an idea, uh, the other, a lot of things we're going to help with Liberia with. One of them is a camp, and we hope to restart this camp. It has been closed for a long time. Uh, but thankfully, when it was built, the buildings were built out of cement, but they need all new roofs, all new um, uh, bunk beds, all new doors, a new we dining know. hall, and a lot of work, probably I'm guessing about $100,000 probably would get this camp up and going. And it had 100 campers every week when it was operating. Why is it important? 40% of the people in Liberia are age 15 and under. Think about that. Yeah. And only 5% of the people in Liberia are 60 and older because so many died in the war, they don't even know how many. And then of course, Liberia went through Ebola, which the Ebola was the opposite of COVID. COVID kills less than 10%. And uh, over 90% survive. Ebola was the opposite. It killed 90% and only 10% survived. So this is a country that we've been in and out of a lot. And as a result, God put our heart there. And the first time I visited in 2004, and I've been to a lot of countries uh, representing the Baptist Children's Home. And it's one of the few countries that I ever returned back in 2004, right after the Civil War ended, that I said to Kathy, what? He said... I could be a missionary in Liberia. <laughs> yeah, so be careful what you tell your wife. And so Kathy and I right now are about 50% of our support. We've been uh, officially missionaries with ABWE for about six months now. And now that things are opening up, would you please have us back yeah. in your church? And also, I just want to say this. Praise the Lord. We're still waiting for, for uh, projects to be approved by the AFBM in Liberia because we want to do what they need, not what we want to do. But a couple of projects they did approve is they need 30 study Bibles for pastors, and they're about $50 a piece, a good uh, study Bible. And they needed seven motorcycles for pastors, which are about $1,000 a piece. And I just want to tell you, when we put that out to those who are supporting us in less than a month, more than the amount of money yeah. came in that we needed for that. Yeah. So praise the Lord. Yeah. So uh, please come back to our display. It doesn't say Liberia, but you'll see the funky uh, tablecloth, which is obviously yes. African. So thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Bill. What a, what a privilege. Boy, as I, I think through life and I look, look at missions over the years, some of you young people don't understand what's happened, but ABWE, I'm, I want to tell you a little story, then we'll have our speaker come. ABWE was in the Philippines at, uh, when World War II hit, and part of the program that Bill was talking about came out of their experience in the Philippines because ABWE had to remove all their missionaries from the Philippines and they were scared to death what would happen to all the churches that they had started. Lo and behold, at the end of the war and they were allowed back in, they went to visit some of these churches and they found out that they were doing better with their local people ministering to them than they did with the missionaries. And ABWE started a program in the Philippines to just train their people to work there in the field. And I am a great believer in that, I really am. And part of that spills over into the United States. I hate to say this, but we're a mission field today. We really are. And it's men like our national rep who allow us to continue to build programs in the United States to allow churches to grow and we can become a filter for missionaries all around the world only if we increase what we're doing in America. And brother, I am so thrilled that you're in the leadership position at the home office and I am, my father knew the, the originators of the JARBC way back in the 30s. And I want to tell you something, I am JARBC to the core, not because I think that everyone in the JRBC is where I am but because together we can make a difference in the world and together we can plant churches here that not only can reach America, but can reach the world for Jesus Christ. Brother, you come and just present the word to us this morning. Hey, thank you so much. Isn't it a blessing to hear from these various missionaries? Appreciate uh, your ministry uh, and excited to see what uh, the Lord is doing through medical missions, and uh, also to the Britons. Boy, it's good to connect with you again. Your, uh, your joy and your love for the Lord and your passion for the gospel is so contagious. And it is humbling and, honor, and honoring just to be with God's choice servants. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your love for the Lord, your love for the local church, your love for his people, your commitment to our doctrinal position. You understand we didn't just parachute into what we believe doctrinally. We believe this is really what the Word of God teaches. That is our commitment based upon a rigid hermeneutic. And by God's grace, as long as God stewards this position to me, we are going to stand fast and faithful to where we are doctrinally. So why don't you go ahead and grab your Bible, if you would, and turn to Luke chapter 10. As you're finding your place, I want us to humbly ask ourselves this question, and let's probe our hearts, if you would. How many of you would say, over the last six months, even though maybe physically you were not able to congregate together, you would say these have been some of the busiest months of your lives? Let me see your hands. It's been taxing, hasn't it? And today we're gonna to examine a common problem for those in vocational ministry. It's busyness. Think of this. Right now on your mind, it might be difficult for you to focus on the message because you've got pack schedules, you've got counseling things that are weighing on you. There might be a knot in your stomach right now because you don't wanna go back and face that opposing church member that's been giving you a difficult time. And this has been a reprieve of sorts. Couldn't wait to get away. You get to get away from so-and-so, but rest assured they're waiting for you when you get home. Administrative duties, 
sermon prep. This is why it's such a humbling honor that you're here, because I know you have messages to prepare, and you don't want to shortcut those. You want to be well prepared. You want to feed God's people well. And there's activities after activities after activity, and then you have on top of that meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Yet in the middle of all of this, if we're not careful, our relationship with God and his word could often be neglected. Even among those who preach the word for a living and minister the word as their primary calling in life. If the Lord tarries and hundreds of years from now somebody is writing a history of Christians in the early 21st century, I think the main word they would use to describe us living today in 2020 going into 2021 would be this, distracted. We are a distracted bunch of people, are we not? So many distractions gnaw at us, pull at us, nag at us from every single direction. And think of the ways we're distracted today. Social media, do I respond to this comment? Do I accept this friend request? This person tweeted about me, this person said this about me in a certain fellowship, and we're constantly bombarded with that, not to mention emails, texts, private messages via social media, schedules, sports, children's sports, grandchildren's sports and activities, hobbies. For me, that's sports. And here's the deal. None of those things I mentioned are necessarily bad. They could all be used well for the glory of God. They're not sinful, but they're terrible replacements for what truly satisfies. They're terrible replacements for what must be the main priority in our lives. And here we get to this text, and I want us to look at just a few verses before we go to lunch. A familiar passage, but one that is so applicable for us in ministry. And let's anchor our hearts deeply in the text today and examine our hearts as to what really is our priority in life. Let's pick it up in verse 38. Let's stand together out of reverence for the word, if we would. We'll read the passage, we'll ask God's blessing, then we'll dive into the text. Verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we commit our time to you. We ask that our hearts, our minds would be held captive by your word right now, that you would help us to examine our hearts, to ask some hard questions we're not comfortable asking, that we'd be quick to confess, eager to repent, and fully embrace that you are a good and a kind and a compassionate and a forgiving God. And there's no better thing in our lives than to spend time with you. So may you be honored, may you be magnified and glorified with this message we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, You can go ahead and be seated if you would, please. We look at the two main characters here outside of Jesus in the text, Mary and Martha. Martha and Mary are two of the most prominent women in the New Testament. You find with Martha, she's always serving. She gets a lot of bad press, but let's be frank here, we need a lot more Marthas in local churches. We find Mary, who's always sitting at the feet of Jesus, either washing his feet or learning from him. And ideally, the church will be filled with both, listeners and learners, listeners and doers, those who sit and those who do the work. But most of us are a bit unbalanced in these areas, are we not? We don't quite strike the right perfect balance. So let me ask you this. 
If you knew Jesus was coming to your home this afternoon, how would you respond to that? How would you respond if the Son of God, God incarnate, were to come into your home this afternoon? Would you immediately grab the vacuum and dust rag? Well, maybe you lean more towards Mary. Would you prepare a notepad and list every single question you would ever want to ask the Son of God? Well, maybe you lean a little bit more towards Martha. For Christmas, Mary would want three brand new systematic theologies under the Christmas tree. Martha would want a gift card to Menard so she could remodel the house. Okay, let me ask you this today. How many of you would see yourself as Mary? All right, nobody. And how many of you see yourself as Martha? All right, most of you do. Thank you for not totally ruining my illustration. It reminds me of this. Uh, Last year, Christina and I, we were doing the state meetings in the state of Colorado. We were in Colorado Springs, and we did a tour of the Navigator's ministry there, that, that castle that they own. And I'll never forget the uh, sign on the wall that just struck with me, or stuck with me, and it said this, when your output exceeds your intake, your upkeep becomes your downfall. And I think that's true for all of us in full-time vocational ministry. And the big idea of today's message is simply this, preoccupy yourself with worship instead of worry. Simply that. Preoccupy yourself with worship instead of worry. In other words, it's not that you shouldn't serve. You should. But that time with Jesus must be our number one priority. So today, you might be working really hard, and I have no doubt that you are. Most pastors and wives that I talk to are exhausted right now. They're just worn out. And and there's no doubt that you're serving and you're busy doing activities for him. But it might be, and I hope I'm wrong on this, but it might be the case, you're not spending much time with him personally. I hit on this a little bit last night. You may not personally be close to his word. If you seek to be used by God but you don't spend much time with God or in his word, this passage will show you what can happen to you. And it's not a path to be on. So if we seek to spend time with God, then we seek to be used by God. But if you seek to be used by God without spending time with God, substantial amounts of time with him every single day, you're headed down a disastrous road in ministry. So learn from someone who did the same thing. Thing. So how do we go from worry to worship? Let's understand a few things about preoccupied hearts, and maybe that's where you are today. You might be so preoccupied today, it's difficult to listen to a sermon, it's difficult to stay focused as you read the Word, it's difficult when you spend time with your spouse to be honed in and focused on serving your spouse. It might be difficult today to do much of anything without being bombarded in your mind with all the things going on in the world and all the pressures of life. Let's look at the dangers of that together in the next few moments. First thought is this. Preoccupied hearts can be overcome by godly activities. That's interesting to think about. Preoccupied hearts can be overcome by godly activities. Look at verse 38 again, if you would. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. The bigger picture of Luke chapter 10 is that Luke 10 is a very busy chapter. There's a lot going on. Luke writing to his original audience who would have been a man by the name of Theophilus. We don't know a lot about him, but I think a lot of times we call Luke uh, Dr. Luke. He was a physician, but more importantly, Luke was a detailed historian. You find that in 24 chapters in the book of Luke, and you find it also in the book of Acts. He was a very detailed historian about the early church. Here we find this small little nugget of a passage right sandwiched in there in the midst of a busy text of Scripture. The disciples are sent out. They've been traveling extensively, undoubtedly exhausted. And according to John 11, Bethany was a village that they lived in, which would have been about two miles from Jerusalem. By the time they get to Mary and Martha's home, they would undoubtedly have been just beat exhausted. How many of you have ever been there in ministry? Where it's like, I am just tired. I need a time out. I need to stop. And Mary, or Martha rather, does something here that's very commendable. 
She welcomes them into her home. Jesus, plus 12 disciples, and possibly others that could have been visitors. Now, how many of you right now would immediately be prepared to welcome that kind of entourage into your home? I mean, I'd want like a month's notice. I want people when they come into my home to think I dust and vacuum every single day. I don't, but I want people to think that when they come into my home. And you'd think, when you look at this, right away we tend to ignore this. She welcomes a large crowd into her home. Notice the word welcomed in verse 38. This is an important word. This word gives the idea to receive, to entertain. She's quick to commit, quick to serve, quick to be hospitable. By having them in her home, she does the same thing we do when we welcome people into her home. She's committing herself, lodging, feeding them, being hospitable. Let's give credit where credit's due. Let's pause as we look at the text. Martha does something here that's very commendable. She's not just hospitable. She is being hospitable to the most important person who's ever walked upon the face of the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. God incarnate, the Son of God, the great I am, the way, the truth, and the life, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the door, the one who was and is and is to come, the Alpha and Omega, the Son of God she welcomes into her home. And when the gospel spread in the early church, and Luke records this in the book of Acts, one of the ways it was spread so effectively is because God's servants were so hospitable with their homes. They were welcoming. Martha's a hard worker. Undoubtedly, our churches would be better served if we had more people like this. And don't miss something that you can learn from Martha. And I think so many of you understand this well. You're in ministry. You use your homes as stewards. You can use your home for ministry simply by being hospitable. Let's look at a second danger with preoccupied hearts. Preoccupied hearts can be overcome by distractions. Look at verse 39, if you would. And now the text kind of pivots a little bit. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Now here's what I think is one of the key phrases in the text, and don't miss this, in verse 40. But Martha was distracted with what? Much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. And let's pause here. The word distraction in the Greek means to have your mind going in all kinds of different directions. It means to be scatterbrained. The English word for distraction simply means this, disattraction. You've lost your attention. To be attracted to someone means you're drawn to them. There's traction. It's kind of like a straight line to that person. You're on a line. To be distracted simply means this. You've lost your focus. That focus isn't there anymore. So the text tells us this. Look at verse 40 again. Martha was distracted. Question, distracted from what or from who? Jesus. And then here's the question, distracted by what? Now here's what's applicable to us today by ministry, by serving. She's not distracted from Jesus by sin, per se. She's distracted from Jesus by service. And I look at this and I say, wow. Can that really happen? What happens, friends, when you put ministry ahead of a relationship? A relationship with the most important one of the universe. Author, theologian Tony Rinke writes this, the heart works best when it's not dominated by cares and demands. So let's look at the juxtaposition of the text here. Look at verse 39. Look at Mary. It says she listened. And the word listen in the Greek gives the idea of continually listening. Constantly listening here. Listening to who? Listening to Jesus. Listening to his word. A similar thing happened to the early church in Ephesus is what you learn here from the text with Martha. Her service actually got in the way of listening 
to his word. I hope you understand the most important time in your church's life is when they come together and they gather around the word on Sundays. The most important time in your church's life. In the church in Ephesus, which had a good doctrinal statement, I'd imagine, they believed correctly, did a lot of good things. And Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 tells him, you take a stand against false doctrine, you work hard, but I have one problem with you. And I'll paraphrase this, you don't love me like you used to. You don't love me like you used to. You're simply doing the right things, you believe the right things, without a genuine love for me. And what's Jesus' remedy in Revelation chapter two? He doesn't tell them to try harder and do better. He doesn't tell them they need new programs. He uses that important word there, he says repent. You need to repent. Believing right and doing right without a right relationship will ultimately lead you astray. And I think this is really the foundation of so many ministry disasters today. You believe right, you do right, you do all the right things, but there's not that right relationship with the Lord. And that's a recipe for disaster. When someone falls away from the Lord, I don't think that their first departure is doctrinal. I've, I've talked to a lot of pastors who've made foolish decisions, and, and not one of them comes to me and says, you know, Mike, it's just because I stopped believing in the inerrancy of Scripture. Th that's not typically what I hear. I believe it starts with a lack of love for the Lord and worship of the Lord. Churches, I'll take it a step further here, and associations lose their effectiveness by losing their heart. Somebody put it this way. This is helpful. The first thing to go will be your heart and then your service. There's no joy anymore in the service. And then your doctrine. You'll adjust your doctrine to fit the coldness of your life. You ever see this in a marriage? Years ago, there was a passion. There was a desire. Couldn't wait to be with her or him. You desire to get married but as years passed and time went on, the heart's not there anymore. The passion's not there. And now the marriage is nothing more than kind of a working business relationship and partnership. Two people who happen to live together. You know one of the most common breeding grounds for this sort of thing to happen? Could be solid local churches with great doctrine. Believing the right things, doing the right things. It also happens in Bible colleges and seminaries. I, I don't know how many times I've heard from those studying for ministry is that they struggle to read the Bible and spend time with the Lord for the sake of their own soul, for the sake of their own personal relationship with the Lord. Those of you who've been to college and seminary, you know how easily this can happen. You study, you read, you do all of those things, but it's not for the sake that you want to love God and know God more and spend more time with him. And that's the most fruitful time of your day because you realize without him, you can do nothing. Now let's ask this. Let's pause and just consider the text. Can what happened to Martha happen to us today in 2020? Can that happen to us today? Thank you for two of you that agree with me. At least they're on the same page. But can that happen to us today, friends? Amen? It definitely can. And what happens when we let distractions rule our life? Look at the text. Let's see some things that are happening here. Number one is this. You become controlling. Martha starts telling Jesus what he ought to do instead of listening to him in regards to what she needed to do. She actually says, tell her. Tell her then to help me. Not only that, you become angry. No one's doing what I'm doing. Woe is me. Look at all that I'm doing and no one's helping. And Martha here is, seems to be angry at Jesus. Don't you care? It's like she accuses Jesus. Confession time. The worst ones at this at times can be pastors. We can study we can visit, we can preach, yet, time after time I hear this, they're not personally spending time 
with God. One of the best ways that you serve your church, and I remember it was Robert Murray McShane that said this, you know, the best way I could serve my church, paraphrasing this, is with my own personal holiness. One of the best ways you serve your church is walk closely with the Lord. Walk closely with him and his word. Not only that, you become controlling, you become angry, you also misjudge. Martha's situation wasn't as bad as she made it out to be. But because she wasn't spending time with Jesus, she wasn't thinking correctly. Her mind wasn't calibrated to his principles. Martha had the idea she was the only one doing what she was doing. Kind of like the Elijah syndrome in 1 Kings chapter 19. No one's doing what I'm doing. I'm left here alone. Oh man, woe is me. And she thought because Mary was not doing what she was doing, Mary must not have been serving. The other thing you'll do is this, is you're going to damage relationships. Notice her words here. Then tell her to help me. Notice Martha's tone. It becomes a bit accusatory. It's harsh. Even this, demeaning. Another thing that can happen is you become proud. Martha thought she was doing all the serving alone. I mean, really? Was she the only one really serving? And this is what happens with proud individuals. They have a misconstrued view of themselves. This puffed up view. Nobody can do what I'm doing. I'm in, nobody can replace me in my ministry. I mean, man, you got to look at what I'm doing. Here's what you find here. She's no longer serving out of joy. She's lost touch with ministry. I asked this last night. You ever serve with people like that? There's no more joy in their ministry. You ever serve with someone constantly just berating ministry, talking about the woes of ministry? What happens then? There's usually tension. There's usually conflict. There's no joy that's there. It's typically no fun. Now, how does God want us to serve them? Right now, today, in 2020, how does God want us to serve? God wants us to serve out of an outflow of love for him and a love for others. And that's why ministry, everything we do, should be based out of a love for him. So preach the word, but do it because you love him. Disciple others, take people under your wing. Pastors, mentor young men in your church. Disciple them in a 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 model and, and disciple them in, with the intent of sending them out into ministry. Let your church be an aircraft carrier that sends people out. Why? Because you love him. Reach your community for Christ because you love him. Sing as unto the Lord because you love him. Play your instruments, sing your songs because your heart is aflame for your love for God. Be faithful even with church discipline. Be faithful in observing the ordinances of baptism in the Lord's table. Why? Because you love him. Confront others in their sin when, when you don't want to and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable and you understand that it might hurt the equity in your relationship with that friend, but do it because you love him. Consider learning and growing. Consider ed, uh, continuing your education, maybe as a full-time Christian servant. Why? Because you love him. Serve your spouse. Serve your wife, your husband, your children, your aging parents, perhaps grandparents. Why? Because you love your Lord. You love your master. Raise your children to the best of your God-given stewardship, not so we can brag and bring glory to ourselves, but because you sincerely, truly, humbly, honestly love the Lord and you desire to bring glory to him with your life. Let's recalibrate our motives today. Why do I do what I do? Why am I doing this? And I want us to take a little journey back in time to when we believe God gave us a desire to go into ministry, pastor a church, be a pastor's wife, or where God sent us on this journey. Remember that excitement, that passion, that zeal? Let's pray we never lose that. Let's pray we never lose that fire and that passion to reach souls, to see people grow and change into the image of Christ, the passion you have for the word. 
Let's recalibrate our hearts today and our motives for the glory of Christ. Let's look at the third and final thing we'll look at in verses 41 and 42. Hearts fixated on Jesus choose what is best over what is good. Look at verse 41, if you would. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus deals with the real problem that Martha is dealing with. And so often in ministry, we can forget the problem really is not the problem. The problem is always the heart. We always have to hone in on the heart. He does not tell her that she needs to start serving. A lot of times we try to get a quick fix and a quick remedy to problems in ministry by saying you need to start doing this and stop doing this. And yes, there's a component of putting off and putting on, but you gotta get down to the root of the problem. He doesn't tell her she needs to start serving. She's already doing that. She has an anxious heart that has caused her to be troubled. Look again, look back to verse 41. He says, but the, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Jesus is grieved here, but he's also compassionately corrective with her. Martha wants Jesus to correct Mary, but Jesus essentially tells Mary, you let Mary stay where she is, I want to correct you. You're the one that needs correction. She was anxious and being worried, eventually chokes the word. So we're not hearing what we really need to hear, and Mary chose the one thing that is necessary. Let's ask this question. What does that mean? What is the one thing that she chose? What does Jesus mean here? Let me illustrate it this way. Let's picture that somebody invites you into their home, and you can't wait to go to their home because you heard they, they just make a mean meal and it's going to be fun, it's going to be relaxing, they got a beautiful home and you can't wait to go there. And when you go to that home and you go to meet with that family, your family meeting with their family, let's say the first thing they do is they start cooking. And they start bringing out all this exquisite silverware and all of this fine china and all they do is talk about the silverware in china. Then, on top of that, after the meal's cooked, they said, we're not going to eat yet. What we're going to do, we're going to vacuum the whole house before we eat. I'm not quite to the point of my Christ-likeness yet where I'm going to be rejoicing if that happened, especially after you get done preaching. And let's say after they get done vacuuming, they say, uh, you know what? We don't think our house is clean enough for you. We're going to dust everything. Then we're going to sweep the floors. Then we're going to mop the floors. Or worse off, here's what they do. They say, we don't have enough food, and there's this hot meal that's sitting there. And they say, we're going to run to the store and get more food. You just wait here. We haven't prayed yet, so you can't eat the meal. And while all of this is fine, the main reason you went to their home was you, to spend time with them, with that person. And here's the point with all of this that I'm trying to illustrate imperfectly. The only thing necessary is you. That's the only thing necessary. It's you. It's nice that you serve, Martha. It's great. And by no means am I advocating that you stop serving in your local church. I enjoy having a clean house. I love having a good meal. But it's even better to spend time with you. There's a need to focus on what's important. And although serving is good, one author puts it this way, sitting at the feet of Jesus is best. Sitting at his feet is best. How do you remedy this? There's one thing we need to do here. And there's a time every day, we take a time out, social media is not preeminent, Text messages are not preeminent. Our sports teams are not preeminent. Our hobbies are not preeminent. Our schedule's not preeminent. Not even time with our spouse at that very time. It's where you withdraw and you get alone with God. 
and you hear from his word, and you pray, and we praise him, and we enjoy his presence that will never leave us and will never forsake us. That's what fuels fruitful ministry long-term. Long-term fruitful ministry is a long-term close ministry that is close to God and is close to his word. Think of the theme of this year's conference. What has been our focus during this whole pandemic? What's been our focus? Is it, if we just get out of this, church life is gonna be good again? If we just have the right person elected to the White House, everything's gonna be good again? If we just have the right Supreme Court, everything's gonna be right again for the church. I have to stop and I have to pause and think, no matter what context of life God has sovereignly ordained for me, I must be close to him. I must be close to his word. This must be the preeminent time, the precious time of my day. Service is great. And I don't think I need to tell you you need to be doing that. In fact, I think all of you are doing that and then some. You are choice servants. I admire you. I'm humbled that I get to preach to you. Tremendous believers, followers of the Savior, you're serving the Lord well. But spending time with the Savior is even better. It's even better. The fervent Christian will not have this sterile and dusty religion that the priest had in the story of the, great, of the Good Samaritan. There's going to be a vibrant, precious, growing, fruitful time with the Lord every single day. And they realize what is needed first is to sit and to listen and enjoy your time with your Savior. Think of your time with God and your walk with God as like a liquid station at a marathon. No human being, I think, is able to run 26.2 miles at a good pace without getting liquids into their body. They have to have water. And they have to have it every so often, every few miles. And if you run 26.2 miles without liquid, you're never gonna make it. In fact, that's our activity this afternoon. We're gonna try to do that to illustrate this message, right? I just wanna make sure you're still with me on this. The same thing is true with your growth in grace. If you run and 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 you never take time to sit at the Savior's feet, here's what happens, and it can happen for those of us in ministry. We become cold. We become irritable. We become indifferent. Even calloused. Self-righteous even where we look down on others and say, they're not doing what I'm doing. And ultimately, you, you, you lose the joy of serving the Lord. I've not been a perfect parent. I know I'm not a perfect husband. But one thing, by God's grace, I hope I've conveyed, if, if you interviewed our children, is that I hope, and I don't know, I've not asked them this, but I hope, and this would give me great joy and even some sort of satisfaction if my kids could say my dad had a great joy in serving the Lord. Not perfect. Many times he had to repent, confess his sin, and ask for forgiveness. But boy, he has joy in serving the Lord. I hope that's our testimony today. That we're not growing cold or calloused or indifferent or even self-righteous but that we understand I must be close to him. I must remain close to him. He is the priority, even over our service. He is the priority. So let's do this. Let's preoccupy yourself with worship instead of worry. Let's preoccupy our hearts with that. And I want to take a moment uh, this is a very unbaptistic thing. I'm actually ahead of schedule right now. And you might actually be early for lunch, which is a very Baptist thing. But I want to take a moment, just a few moments, for us to have a quiet time with the Lord. And uh, for us to, uh, you can bow your head, you can close your eyes, but just to have a time of us 
coming before the Lord, maybe we need to confess that that service has been a priority over spending time with him. And ask God to recalibrate our hearts and for us to choose worship over worry. Let's take a few moments to do that right now. Precious Father, it truly is a joy to be in your presence. And Father, we pray that, um, that we would not just know about you, but that we would come to know you personally more. Give us, I pray, a hunger, a passion, and a, and a desire to have a personal relationship with you that's growing, that's fruitful, that's marked by increasing godliness and Christlikeness in our lives. And bless your choice servants. There's a lot of things gnawing at them, tugging at them at every direction. Could be volatile church members. It, it could be not recognizing and not always being aware of what the laws are or what's going on or, or understanding a pandemic that's new to us. Father, give us wisdom, but more than anything, give us a closeness to you. May our service be fueled by our relationship with you. And Father, I pray that your word would find residence in our hearts, that we'd have a greater awe and a greater reverence, a more profound worship and fear of you. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said together.